Okay, well, as you guys know from the title, I am checking out What Culture and Watch Mojo. So that's pretty much my plan on this video. Uh, yeah, I never even heard of What Culture. I was like, What Culture the hell is this? Someone recommended me to check out What Culture because they said that it puts them in the mind of Watch Mojo videos. And since Hello, I've been reacting to Watch Mojo and Miss Mojo videos, I was like, Okay, I'm gonna give What Culture a freaking shot. So, in this video, which you guys know, I am checking out a what culture video. It'll be my first freaking time. So I am ready. Afterwards, it's going to be a, another Watch Mojo video that I've never even seen. So that's pretty much this video, like I said. So for anybody that is still watching, let's go ahead and do this mess. I am ready. So let me go ahead and check out this video. Let's go. Okay, let's go. Nowadays, retcon can mean a few things. Sometimes, retcons are genuine gotcha moments from a team of smart writers subverting audience expectations to pull off a major twist or reveal. Sometimes, they're genuinely interesting new pieces of information that complicate or deepen the lore of your favorite TV world. But sometimes, they're writing decisions that genuinely make the audience scratch their heads. Whether they appear to be new pieces of information that just don't fit right with what we knew before, or are just genuinely horrible twists that make no sense within the context of the show, retcons can often feel like lazy afterthoughts that writers introduce for cheap new conflict, to chicken out of the stakes they'd set themselves up for, or to desperately wrap up a loose end with out-of-character decisions. I'm Ellie for What Culture here with 10 controversial TV show retcons that pissed off fans. Number 10, Roseanne, It Was All A Book. This one gets a little hard to follow, but the general gist is that season nine of the classic sitcom Roseanne revealed that almost all of the events seen in the show up until that point were fictional versions of the truth. As the character of Roseanne what? is seen as an aspiring author writing half truths about her own life. So the first retcon was the spin on the it was all a dream, which never goes down well, as it just leads audiences into thinking that they've wasted their time. The second retcon was that Roseanne's husband, Dan, had actually died at the end of season 8, and all of his involvement in the semi-fictional season 9 was Roseanne dealing with her grief. This essentially made the entirety of season 9, if not the whole show, worthless, as it all turned out to be false by the final episode. The third retcon is a positive one that accounts for the sheer laziness of the It Was All A Dream slash book retcon from the original show. With the Roseanne revival airing in 2019, 22 years after season 9 finished. The revival reveals that the heartbreaking but still lazy retcon of Dan's actual death was, you guessed it, the fictional ending of Roseanne's book. He's mm. still alive, and the retcon that angered every Roseanne watcher in the 90s was all a ruse. Number 9, that? Prison Break, So oh. Many Fake Deaths. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, and your TV show has some serious issues when it comes to retconning deaths just for shock value. The first instance of Prison Break faking the death of a major character was the murder of Sarah, as she is beheaded at the start of season 3. Lincoln sees her severed head and decides to conceal the truth from his brother Michael. Then at the start of season 4, it's revealed that she's actually perfectly alive, so despite Lincoln physically seeing her severed head and believing it to be real, this is then retconned. Then it happened again! In the final break, we see the very clear death of Michael to save Sorry. Sarah. His family move on with their lives and the ending is bittersweet with Sarah and their newborn son being left behind. This death, though, is retconned purely to make the revival series work, and eight years after audiences had come to terms with his death, the entire ending of the final break is retconned to again reveal <laughs> that the death was fake and instead we have another season of breaking out of prisons to do. Number yeah, eight, yeah. Sherlock. Did you miss me? The ending of the 2016 Sherlock Christmas special, The Abominable Bride, sees the return of Moriarty in digital form. His face is flashed all across London with the iconic Did You Miss Me being repeated over and over Man, to all Sherlock and the rest of the nah. world on his potential disruption from beyond Did the grave. Me? The ending of this episode being dedicated uh -uh. entirely to this enormous cliffhanger, including a fan service post credit scene where Moriarty turns directly to the camera and says, Miss me? to the audience. Yo, well, that suggested that Moriarty would be a large player I in the like, show's nah. grand final season. 
Sherlock seems to think so himself as he states, Moriarty's dead, and I know exactly what he's going to do next. Well, it turns out it was all one big pointless publicity grab leading into the final season. As the start of season four immediately retcons this cliffhanger as Sherlock is shown to have no idea what Moriarty is going to do next. Mainly because Moriarty has absolutely nothing to do next and the public had no reason to miss him while awaiting his return. Moriarty's role in season four is tiny and is shown solely through flashbacks secretly planning his games alongside Sherlock's long lost sister, AKA all things we've already seen. Number seven, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Dawn. <laughs> this one's dawn. interesting uh -oh. because it involves a fake retcon. Despite her spontaneous entrance into the show after previous information given to the audience completely contradicted God, her existence, Dawn me. Summers was entirely intended uh -oh. by the writers to confuse fans by being nonsensical and unexplained. Then this retcon was explained to be a big interesting plotline for the show that still pissed fans off. Dawn appears at the start of season five as Buffy's younger sister, despite the show very clearly establishing Buffy as an only child. This in itself is a huge retcon of Buffy's personal history, as for four episodes, Dawn exists in the Scooby gang's life as if nothing were amiss, and that Buffy had always had a sister. This was then retconned by revealing that Dawn was actually a mystical power known as the Key, and was transformed into a physical being and given to Buffy as a sister to protect. The main characters all have false memories of her existence implanted by the monks who created her, and the show continues on with Dawn as a main character despite these falsehoods. Dawn is not a light character in the Buffy universe. She was listed by Entertainment Weekly as one of the most annoying characters on TV, Come alongside on. loathed juggernauts such as Janice from Friends and Nikki and Paolo from Lost. Number six, supernatural, archangel vessels, and fake stakes. It has long been accepted to never ever take the stakes in Supernatural at face value. Mm -hmm. The Winchester brothers have died so many times each that it's difficult to ever believe they're in any real danger. And there are multiple oh, instances geez. across the lore of the show. But in <laughs> you cast annoyed me. Like, it was so obvious that he was there for the fan service. Especially the later seasons, because I'm just like, yo, he could have been gone. Like, he was pretty much Dean's freaking dog. He's like, I'm the angel of the Lord. Please, BS, man. You was Dean's dog. <laughs> uh uh, yo. Mm -mm. Information is retconned to suit a new angle of the plot and keep everyone safe. But Archangels and their vessels are such a vital part of the plot that it's pretty annoying to never get solid answers on what their true functions are. Dean and Sam were preordained from birth to be the vessels for Michael and Lucifer respectively, mm -hmm. and yet the show never commits to any definition of what it means to be a vessel. In the third episode of season five, Dean and Castiel Castillo visit Vito. Donnie Finneman in the hospital, who has been left mm -hmm. brain dead after being the vessel for Raphael. Castiel solemnly tells Dean that Michael's power will leave Dean's body in an even worse state once he's through with him and that vessels end up paralyzed as a minimum after hosting an archangel. This very clearly set up the stakes and emphasized the power of the archangels. If Dean is taken over, he'll be left for dead once his purpose has been served. But later on in the season, Michael tells Dean he won't leave him a drooling mess and in season 12, President Jefferson Rooney is completely fine after being Lucifer's vessel. So what is the truth? Was Castiel just lying or did the writers put that bit of lore in just for dramatic effect, knowing that they would retcon it later to become yet another example of Winchester plot armor? Number five, Pretty Little Liars, Ian's death. Any Pretty I've Little never Liars seen family freaking show, family, Pretty Little Liars the show at is all. riddled with retcons to the point where it becomes ridiculous to attempt to understand it all. For a show centered around mystery after mystery after mystery after The only thing I heard about Pretty Little Liars is one of the main characters was dating and then married a freaking teacher. That's all I know about this freaking show. <laughs> okay. Mystery, it had a huge habit of forgetting to solve them once the characters had moved on to the next one. One of the earliest examples is the death of Ian Thomas. As the liars attempt to unravel the mystery behind their friend Allison's disappearance and an anonymous stalker known as A, they begin to suspect Ian. After an already retconned apparent death, where he is hanging from a series of ropes in a church after recognizing A, the girls re-encounter Ian later on, dead in a barn from an apparent suicide. Everything about the death is suspicious, with the suicide note claiming to have been riddled with guilt at killing Allison, who, spoiler alert, is 100% not dead, that is quickly discovered to have been forged by A. 
So the question becomes, what did Ian know that A could at risk getting out? It was clear to everyone that there was foul play involved. Except there wasn't. Four years after Ian's death episode aired, the show's creator, Marlene King, did an interview to clear up fan questions that had gone unanswered in the show. King's response? It actually was a suicide, but the note was still forged. This makes no sense. The fact that it came out so many years later in a single line in an interview just to wrap up loose ends was an insult to the fan base. Number so there was four, no Game answer as well. Wow. The deterioration of Daenerys. Hour-long analyses have been filmed on the awful character development of Daenerys in the final season of Game of Thrones. And many fans believe that the truly rushed exploration of her madness can be seen as a sudden retcon of the character they'd grown to love over the years. To a lot of fans, it was pretty clear that Daenerys wasn't going to stay on the straight path to being a virtuous queen. We saw her mean streak in the events in the early part of Season 7, such as killing people for failing to bend the knee, which made it clear that she was prepared to be ruthless to gain her power. However, the bell sees Daenerys brutally murder every man, woman, and child in King's Landing, even after they had surrendered to her. As a queen who always stood up for the rights of the people, the yeah, madness of Daenerys simply did not have enough time dedicated to it to be seen as anything but a sudden retcon of her entire moral compass for the sake of wrapping up the series by the end of the next 90 minute session. For the better part of seven seasons, the characters had developed and grown. However, season eight felt like falling off a cliff in terms of writing quality. And Daenerys' sudden descent into unbelievable crimes after learning about her across eight years becomes nothing short of lazy writing to wrap up the show in less episodes than it should have had to execute the moral switch successfully. Number three, The Walking Dead, Walker Blood. <laughs> As a preface to this retcon, cast your mind uh -uh. back to season five, where Sasha accidentally slashes Abraham with a bloodied knife. Oh, that's right, I remember walker. that. Yeah, yeah. Then, when Shane stabbed himself with a knife he'd used to kill a walker. Or when Andrea got walker blood in her eye, or when Rick slices his leg open with a machete sticking out of a zombie corpse. It was apparent to fans of the comics that infection by way of blood was simply not going to be adapted into the show. A big plot point in the comics was that Negan would cover his weapons with walker blood and guts to ensure instant death in the human he was killing. And fans just assumed this wouldn't get covered. But fans were wrong, and this plotline really begins stupid. to play out exactly as it is in the comics at the ripe old age of season 8. Long after many characters should have been affected by this now established and consistent method of infection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if characters like Shane and Abraham were fine because of only minor contamination rather than deep slashes like those in Hilltop, it's a huge retcon to the lore of the show. Considering the survivors are multiple years into the apocalypse at this point, it's ridiculous that the entire cast of characters would only just be discovering this as a cause for concern and method of killing for Negan when it's pretty much always established in the comics. Number two, Gossip Girl, the identity of Gossip Girl. Yeah, it's up. always difficult <laughs> to pull off a the like show him. One, especially. <sighs> Yo, Gossip Girl was a waste. <laughs> Like, the earlier seasons was pretty good, but then later seasons, especially the finale, I'm like, what in the world? Dan is Gossip Girl, like, really? <laughs> that made no sense. Like, they just threw it in there, like, oh, huh, yeah, let's, let's shock the fans. Yeah, let's make Dan, out of all the characters, let's make Dan be Gossip Girl. Like, really? When one like, of your central WTF. characters has been the culprit from the very first episode of a six season show. Inconsistencies are bound to be brought up by eagle eyed viewers, and a little leeway is somewhat expected in cases like this. But Dan being revealed as Gossip Girl pissed fans off. A lot. Including me. And the sheer ridiculousness of some yeah, of these inconsistencies me. can be described as nothing short of the most annoying retcons imaginable. Gossip Girl is an anonymous stalker that reveals secrets about the lives of an affluent group of socialite friends on a blog. So the Dan reveal is so packed with retcons that it's difficult to know where to start. One instance Trash. is that Gossip Girl spreads rumors of Dan's 15-year-old sister's sex life. Another is that we see Dan reacting to blog posts as they appear on his screen with pure shock while sitting completely alone in a room. He's seen anonymously sending tits to Gossip Girl. Gossip Girl also reveals that Dan and Serena, his ex-girlfriend, share a half-sibling, a fact that Dan was very adamant about wanting to keep quiet. Once season six rolled around and the big reveal took place, 
it became clear to fans very quickly that Dan's identity as Gossip Girl was simply not planned from the start, resulting in several blatant retcons of previous pieces of information that were just left blissfully unexplained. Number one. Mm -mm, they, that, that really made no sense. Like, they could have made Nate be Gossip Girl, Serena be Gossip Girl, whatever, Georgina, who else? Chuck, Blair, his little sis Jenny any characters but Dan really Dan <laughs> I said Serena but not even Serena could be Gossip Girl I don't think but I'm like whatever crazy Dallas, it was all BS. a dream if this retcon happened today in one of the top shows on television you would practically hear Twitter having its seething meltdown Probably the most iconic TV retcon of all time, the end of season 8 saw Dallas family patriarch Bobby Ewing die surrounded by his family after saving his wife Pamela from being hit Cruel by a intentions? car. Season 9 continued with the regular cast members going about their business while grieving his loss. And while the death was hard on viewers that had come to care deeply for the character, it seemed like Dallas would continue on nonetheless. Bobby's portrayer, Patrick Duffy, had left the show to pursue other acting options. But season 9 saw a huge decline in ratings for the show, and the producers convinced him to return to the role. This meant Forcing a huge him to return, retcon what? was on the horizon in order to make Bobby's return work. Uh -oh. A character being magically revived after a sad death would have been a large enough retcon to piss off How fans that pretty work? severely. But what made it all worse was that the show's writers decided to erase the entirety of season 9 in order to bring him back. Yet the season 9 finale showed Pamela waking up and finding Shut her husband very up. much alive in the shower. And it was revealed that she had dreamed all 30 episodes that viewers had become invested was she in. A coma? How long was she asleep for? 30 episodes worth of sleep time? Yes, please. Uh oh. No. Okay, watch Mojo. Peter Pan! You don't say. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the most sinister theories that change the way we see movies. Let's Consider this your spoiler warning. It was cold and dark, nothing but sand and a couple of Lincoln logs. Number 30, Bill's Not Dead, Kill Bill Volume 2. In the second Kill Bill film, the bride gets her long-awaited revenge when she kills Bill with the five-point palm exploding heart technique. Plan A taught you the five-point palm exploding heart technique. It seems like we can conclusively say Bill How is, is dead, alive? right? Well, maybe not. A popular fan theory nah. speculates that Bill actually survived. During the final credits, every actor who played a character that the bride killed had their names crossed out. Oh, Yet when we get to Bill's, actor David Carradine's name is still intact. Maybe the bride didn't actually succeed and Bill lived? Was this just a production goof? Or was it a sign that the bride's vengeful triumph didn't come to pass? You can decide. We look ready. Number 29. The ending is a dream. Minority Report. Josh Anderton is an officer who goes on the run after getting accused of a crime he hasn't committed yet. Minority Report is a dystopian story, but it appears to wrap up with a pretty storybook ending. Anderton clears his name, and the oppressive systems at work undergo a change for the better. A place where they could find relief from their gifts. Okay. A place where they could live out their lives in peace. But what if the outcome was actually much darker? A theory among viewers is that the film's ending was actually just a dream. When Anderton is arrested and sent to the dreamlike prison, he doesn't actually escape. Instead, he just sees everything that he wants to see happen, like the other prisoners. John's Ew, happy man. ending could just be a mirage. It's actually kind of a rush. They say you have visions, that your life flashes before your eyes, that all your dreams come true. <laughs> Number oh, 28, dream. Okay. Dell's trunk has his wife's corpse, planes, trains, and automobiles. Dark. For fans of Gosh. the 80s comedy Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, the question of what's in Dell's travel trunk is a pretty popular one. The heavy piece of luggage is quite the hassle for Dell and Neil to lug around. Could that be because it has a body inside of it? Near the end of their journey, Dell reveals that his wife is dead. Murray's been dead for eight years. Wow, eight years. With that years, in mind, okay. some have suggested that Dell's deceased wife is actually inside of the trunk. 
It can be extremely difficult to get over like, the death really of a significant that, really? other. <laughs> However, this theory is okay. particularly disturbing, especially since Dell has been a Shut widower up. for eight years. Are you crazy? Not yet, but I'm getting there. Number 27. Ned is the devil and he put Phil in purgatory. Groundhog Day. When rude weatherman Phil Connors gets That's stuck annoying. inside of a time loop, he's forced to live February 2nd on repeat. By the end of the movie, he's able to escape the loop and become a changed man. But one Reddit fan theory puts everything in a new Reddit. light. The idea okay. is that Ned Ryerson, the insurance man who annoys Phil, is actually mm. the devil. Phil, I sell insurance. What a shock. Do you have life insurance? Because if you do, you can always Get use a little out. more. Am I right or am I right or am I right? He places Phil inside uh -oh. of the time loop after Phil brushes him off. And if you've ever noticed, it's only when Phil actually buys the insurance that he finally leaves the loop. He only mm -hmm. gains his freedom after acquiescing to the Prince of Darkness's whims. Phil, this is the best day of my life. Mine too. <laughs> Mine too. <Jeez. laughs> Number 26. Uh -uh. Amity has been covering up shark attacks for years. Jaws. When a great white shark starts terrorizing the denizens of Amity Island, it becomes police chief Martin Brody's job to bring the monster down. But was That's this right. really the first time the island had a situation like this? One theory no. suggests that Amity Island actually had quite a few incidents with bloodthirsty sharks that were covered up. Uh, summer girl goes swimming. <sighs> Runs out a little she tires. Fishing boat comes along. It's happened before. Uh, I don't think you appreciate the gut reaction people have to these things. When the attacks began in Jaws, Mayor Larry Vaughn is eager to keep them under wraps. There might not be as much hard evidence for this theory, but it's a darkly compelling idea that Brody is just the first chief determined to do something about a public threat. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Number 25. The appliances represent mental health conditions. The Brave Little Toaster. This animated adventure follows sentient household appliances in search of their owner. While it's an out there premise, The Brave Little Toaster is an overall endearing movie. However, one fan theory adds a complex layer to the story. I know what goes on in this cottage. It's a conspiracy. And every one of you low watts is in on it. It suggests that the sentient appliances are patients who have recently left a psychiatric hospital. The theory goes so far as to diagnose certain conditions and phobias for the characters, like Toaster being claustrophobic and Radio having bipolar disorder. Things could be worse, you know. Oh. How? How what? How could they be worse? They couldn't. I lied. According to the theory, their owner actually represents different people waiting to be reunited with their loved ones. Number 24. Matilda was a oh. secret government experiment. Matilda. One of the biggest mysteries from the Matilda movie is how the titular character gains her magical powers. Mm. Rather than being a random power from birth, one rather grim theory suggests that Matilda was a creation of the government. Mm. When the FBI agents visit to keep tabs on what her dad's up to, they're actually covertly keeping a watchful eye on Matilda. Aren't you supposed to be in school, young lady? I really hope you have a search warrant. <laughs> we know it might sound like we're wearing tinfoil hats, but this wouldn't be the strangest explanation for her powers. Still, the idea that Matilda might secretly have been birthed as a military weapon is a bleak prospect. No more Miss Nice Girl. Number 23. Dorothy is a variant of the Wicked Witch of the East, the Wizard of Oz. Toto? Feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. We all know Dorothy is a good-hearted and hopeful girl who only wants to get back home. Or do we? There may be more to Dorothy than we thought, or more versions of Dorothy than we thought. Isn't it odd how nearly everyone from Kansas has a variant of themselves in the her. land of Oz except her? One theory mm. proposes that she does have a doppelganger, the Wicked Witch of the East. Who killed so the Wicked Witch? Ruby Slippers. Was it you? No. No, it was an accident. I didn't mean to kill anybody. When Dorothy lands in Oz, her arrival accidentally kills the witch. She then mm. inherits her red slippers, which just so happened to be a perfect fit. Could there mm. be a multiverse of evil Dorothys out I didn't there? Even think of that. Number 22, Everyone's Dead, Coraline. Coraline when yeah. trying to get accustomed to the new house her family has moved into, Coraline Jones stumbles upon an alternate world filled to the brim with fantasy. 
The stop-motion adaptation of Neil Gaiman's novella Coraline is a pretty dark film. Although aimed at children, it's undeniably an intense watch. So how could this movie get even darker? Well, one interpretation of the film suggests that all of the characters in the Pink Palace apartments are dead. Now, you're going to stay Jeez. here forever. Think about it like this. The garden is heaven, the house is purgatory, and the other world is hell. That's definitely one way to make this movie even more unnerving. It's okay. her sister. Before she disappeared. The sweet ghost girl. Number 21. Pennywise and Mary Poppins are the same species. It and Mary what? Poppins returns. On the one what? hand, this is an incredibly outlandish theory. On the other, it's so wild that we kind of wish it were canon. The Come premise on, connects dots that we wouldn't think to compare. But think about it. Both Mary Poppins and Pennywise can create elaborate illusions and have a strong what? affinity for red balloons. I bet I could cheer him up. I never balloon. even thought of that mess. Do you want a balloon too, Georgie? Despite making Heck an impression so. everywhere they go, people tend to magically forget about them once they leave. And that's not all. Both resurface years after their last visit. I was just your age when we first met. Wow. Working for a chimney sweep. These might be coincidences, but what if they aren't? Would Mary Poppins secretly devour children? Could Pennywise so use disturbing. an umbrella to fly? The world's ripe with possibilities. Number 20. Rose imagined Jack to cope with her depression. Titanic. What? Nah. Huh? There are a lot of theories circling the web regarding Titanic, but none are likely as dark as the theory that Rose imagined what? Jack to cope with her depression. No, After all, no. the first time Jack and Rose met, she's deeply unhappy with her life. Stay back. That makes no sense. What? what? If Jack didn't exist and it was all in Rose's head, how did people interact with him? And then also the nude drawing. Like, how did that work? That makes no sense. Nah. Nah. That is the most ridiculous theory. Okay. Continue. Don't come any closer. Perhaps she imagined this beautiful and charming man to cope with her misery and mm, abuse of Beyonce. This would also explain why there are no records of Jack. He simply doesn't exist. We never found anything on Jack. How did they interact with him then? That's what I would no, like to know. Wouldn't be, would there? And I've never spoken of him until now. Some people also believe that Jack is a time traveler from the future, and while a case could be made for that, it isn't quite as dark as depressed woman imagines a charming man to save mm -mm. her from herself. Look, look. That theory of him being a time traveler makes a whole lot sense. Then, oh my gosh, Jack doesn't exist and it's all in Rose's head because I'm just like, yo, how do these people interact with him then? Like, that made absolutely no freaking sense whatsoever. Number 19. Kevin grows up to be Jigsaw, the Home Alone <laughs> franchise, the Saw franchise. Yo, I am dead. So what? Yeah, yeah, totally. Because look at the actor, yes, for sure. As you all know, the first two Home Alone movies concern Kevin setting traps against a couple of stupid criminals. But doesn't he seem to have a little too much fun in torturing and causing these men extreme pain? I would. According to some, Kevin never grew out of his need to create elaborate sadistic traps, changed his name to John Kramer, perhaps mm -mm. after serving some time, and later became the Jigsaw Killer to satisfy his psychotic need to torture people. Okay, the timeline doesn't really add up, as Kevin is 8 in 1990 while Jigsaw is in his 50s come the early 2000s, but just ignore that and go with it. Oh, that I'm Jigsaw. That, that, that Kevin McAllister grew up, to, grew up to be Jigsaw from Saw. <laughs> Ridiculous that's, that's theory. That one, yeah, yeah, I've heard that one. Mm -hmm. Number 18. The Ghostbusters died when they crossed the streams. Ghostbusters and what Ghostbusters 2. What is going 2. on with Something so many, like, it's a dream. Death's like... Don't cross the stream. Huh? It's made very clear by Egon that crossing Yo, the code people. on pack streams is catastrophic. Yet, at the end of the movie, the Ghostbusters intentionally cross their streams to destroy the dimensional gate. 
Some fans posit that the Ghostbusters died and that Ghostbusters 2 takes place in purgatory. And it's just their spirits. As you know it, stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. This would explain the repetition of the first movie's plot, the Ghostbusters' bad reputation, and why no one else believes in the supernatural, despite the events of the first movie. Excuse me, Egon. You said crossing no. the streams was bad. Cross the streams. You're gonna endanger us. You're gonna endanger our client. Finally, Ghostbusters 2 ends with a chorus of Old Lang Syne a song often sung at funerals, and a painting of heavenly Ghostbusters. Both could signify that the Ghostbusters are finally moving on, having completed their mission in purgatory. Yo, what is up with these theories, though? Sorry, Half of them make no sense. Number 17. The Joker is a disgruntled soldier. The Dark Knight. I believe. Whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you a stranger. This one isn't so much dark as it is just sad and scary. According to one popular theory, the Joker is a war veteran who is struggling mentally. There are numerous traits to his character that seem to support oh, this, his including himself. his weapons knowledge, mm -hmm. his physical fighting skills, his tactical know-how, and his ability to perfectly perform the funeral ritual. A few of his quotes also suggest military experience, including I would start with the head, the victim gets all fuzzy. And resentment, like If tomorrow I tell the press that I'd like a gangbanger, we'll get shot. Or a truckload of soldiers will be blowing up. Nobody panics. The Joker is clearly psychotic, but he could also be a very pained and traumatized man. See, I'm not a monster. I'm just ahead of the curve. Number 16. Donnie died in Vietnam. The Big Lebowski. We're talking about unchecked yeah, aggression are. here. What the f my about? rug. Forget it, Donnie. You're out of your element. One of the most popular Wait, aspects of the Big Lebowski is the friendly Jeez. yet hateful relationship between Walter and Donnie. However, some fans believe that Donnie doesn't actually exist. You see, Donnie is actually an old friend of Walter's who died fighting alongside him in Vietnam. The reason Walter is always telling Donnie to shut up is because he knows Donnie isn't real and he's trying to get a grip on reality. This also explains why people barely address Donnie. When the nihilists attack Walter, he's reminded of his time in Vietnam and confronts the memory of Donnie's death, allowing him to release both his guilt and the memory of Donnie, signified by Donnie's heart attack. Call the medic. <laughs> Number 15. The briefcase contains Marcellus Wallace's soul. Pulp Fiction. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> The mysterious briefcase is a classic example of a MacGuffin. It drives the plot, but understanding it is ultimately inconsequential. Theories abound, but some have gone so far as to suggest that it contains the very soul of Marcellus Wallace. According to the theory, the devil took Marcellus's soul from the back of his neck, hence the weird neck band-aid. The code to the briefcase is also 666, suggesting Marcellus's deal with the devil. Another thing to note is the orange glow that flashes upon Brett's death, which is perhaps indicative of his soul leaving his body. Is orange what? the color of our souls, and is Marcellus's contained within that briefcase? And you will know my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. Number 14. Aladdin is set in a dystopian future. Aladdin. I'm bringing outfits. Some Disney fans seemingly have a thing for the post-apocalypse. According to them, Cars takes place in a distant future where humans have gone extinct, and Aladdin takes place thousands of years from now in a dystopian social reality. Why? Well, the genie states that Aladdin's outfit is so third century, and he does various impressions of modern celebrities like Jack Nicholson, indicating that he was around between the 3rd and 20th centuries. Genie, I need help. All right, Sparky, here's the deal. If you want to court the little lady, you gotta be a straight shooter, do you got it? But he also states that he's been imprisoned for 10,000 years, which means Aladdin could take place around the year 12,000, when humanity has been ruined by a catastrophe Jeez. that decimated modern technology and lifestyles. 10,000 years will give you such a crick in the neck. Number 13. Man. Grease is Sandy's elaborate fantasy before she drowns. Grease. Death. Yo. Is this the end? Charming, nostalgic musical or elaborate death fantasy. You be the judge. Because you secretly know every word to Summer Nights, you know Danny's line, I saved a life, she nearly drowned. But what if he didn't? 
According uh. to the theory, Sandy did drown, and the entire movie is a wish-fulfilling fantasy that Sandy's brain plays out as she dies. This certainly helps to explain the weird ending where Danny and Sandy fly away in the car, which oh, can be interpreted so as Sandy's final ascent into like the afterlife. For those who've always wondered what the deal was with that scene, you've got a possible explanation, just not a very happy one. I've just had the best summer of my life wow. and now I have to go away. It isn't fair. Number 12. The ending is happening in James Bond's head. Spectre. James Bond meets a worthy and old adversary in Spectre. After being directed to Blofeld's base, Blofeld tortures Bond with a brain drill. Bond then escapes with the help of a too perfectly timed Madeline, defeats Blofeld, and destroys his base in a video gamey fashion. Or does he? Perhaps the ridiculous escape and subsequent third act are simply visions Bond has while he dies from Blofeld's brain drill. This theory borrows heavily from Terry Gilliam's Brilliant Brazil, where the tortured character envisions his rescue and subsequent heroics. So, does that mean that the rest of the series will be James Bond's adventures in the afterlife? Doesn't time no fly. Clue. Yeah, just stand there, yeah. Number 11, awesome. Josh killed Heather and Mike, The Blair Witch Project. Josh? That would have been a plot twist. The ending to The Blair Witch Project is already dark, but this theory makes it even darker. Midway Damn. through the movie, Josh goes missing, and Heather discovers a bundle of sticks containing Damn. bloody clothes Josh. and teeth. However, Josh's body is never found, Damn. and Heather and Mike continue to hear him screaming, indicating that he's still alive. That would have been an interesting one. At the end of the movie, both the Heather and Mike are seemingly killed by The Blair Witch. However, it very well could have been Josh who murdered the students, either through possession or of his own free will. The lack of answers is yeah, precisely what body? makes this movie so divisive, inviting this sort of dark what-if interpretation. What if for sure. Number 10. Michael becomes Travis Bickle, the deer hunter and taxi driver. Y'all need a stop. Y'all need a seriously stop. <laughs> Yeah, because the same lot. actor, just like Evan. Robert De Niro played two of the uh -oh. most iconic movie characters of the 70s, Mike Vronsky, a Pennsylvania veteran dealing with the fallout of his and his friends tour in the Vietnam War, and the unhinged taxi driver Travis Bickle, another nom vet. Honorable discharge, May 1973. Oh, in the army? Marines. While the war was obviously a topical subject for films from this decade, the relationship between these two characters could be much deeper. The Deer Hunter ends in 1975 when Mike buries his friend Nick. Taxi Driver takes place the following year, with the troubled Travis unable to sleep. Perhaps Mike changed his name and moved to New York City in a futile <laughs> attempt to shed his old life and inner demons. You talking to me? You talking to me? Number 9. Peter Pan is the Angel of Death. Peter Pan. Oh, Peter! I knew you'd come back. Well, There's so, so many much for this whimsical children's for tale. Pan. There are numerous theories regarding Disney's Peter Pan, and a Go lot ahead. of them boil down to Peter Pan being a childish grim reaper and Neverland being the afterlife. One theory posits that Wendy dies of leukemia and Peter guides her to the afterlife, also known as Neverland, where many of Wendy's real life acquaintances are cartoonishly exaggerated. Another theory posits that Wendy, John, and Michael all died, were transported to the afterlife by Peter, and met more dead children, also known as the Lost Boys. Jeez. Why do you think they never grow up? Well, if you died in childhood, you literally can't. I'm certainly proud of you, you blockheads. Number eight, Bruce Wayne dies in the end. The Dark Knight Rises. What are you doing? I can get it out over the bay. Oh my gosh. Can you fly it over the water that ejects? Many His fans voice, had issues nah. with The Dark Knight Rises. His voice for Batman. The overly uh -uh. dramatic ending which sees Batman hauling a nuclear bomb out of Gotham. While many rightfully assume that Batman is dead, having sacrificed himself for Gotham, Alfred later spots the very much alive Bruce and Selina while vacationing in Italy. Now, what are the odds of that? Some people believe it was simply a figment of Alfred's imagination. Bruce really did die in the nuclear explosion, and the grieving Alfred traveled to Florence to alleviate his sorrow. He then wills himself to imagine the happy couple and finally lets go of his grief, happy at the thought of Bruce's contentment. Number We're seven, okay. Toy Story 3 is about the Holocaust. Toy Story 3. Yo. 
What? People in we all know that Toy Story 3 is the saddest movie ever, but this theory does the seemingly impossible by making it even sadder. To begin with, the toys are left behind, similar to the Jewish people in Germany during the Third Reich. They then discuss what happened and what to do in a scene very similar to The Pianist, and Buzz suggests going to the attic like Anne Frank. We're going into attic mode, folks. Keep your accessories with you at all times. They're then transported in a box, like a train, to a daycare full of undesired toys, like a concentration camp. Here they're mistreated and eventually sent to an incinerator. We're not sure if this was intended or not, but the parallels are heartbreaking. My gosh. Freaking there. Oh, geez, no. Number six, Ferris Bueller is a figment of Cameron's imagination. Ferris Bueller's day off. Then I what? watched myself from inside. I realized it was ridiculous. What's happening? Being afraid. There's a widely held belief that the events of Ferris Bueller's day off take place Why entirely Ferris inside Cameron's existed. head. This is also known as the Fight Club theory due to its similarities with that movie's plot. It posits that Ferris is a symbolic representation of Cameron's wish to be more confident and daring. While laying in bed, he imagines his confident yeah, alter ego like, joy riding like in a fancy in car, out. cozying up to his girlfriend, and just generally enjoying a carefree existence. It could also be a meditative method Cameron uses to Back. assert more control over his life, symbolized by the destruction of his controlling father's car. Who do you love? Who do you what love? kind of theory is that? Number five, Totoro is the god of death, my neighbor Totoro. This Miyazaki masterpiece that. is about two girls who move into an old house after their mother becomes ill and then befriend a forest entity they name Totoro. But who or what is this creature? Could it be the god of death? According to legend, only people who have died or are close to death can see the god of death. And near the movie's beginning, the girls see soot sprites, rumored to represent impending death in Japanese folklore. As the theory goes, Mai actually drowns in the pond, and Satsuki cannot bear the pain of this loss. They then posthumously visit their dying mother with the help of Totoro, and she fills their presence. Ugh. I am like dead with these theories. Like, what the hell? Why is this so dark? Like, come on, really? The theories gotta be so freaking dark? Number four, Edna purposefully gave Syndrome a cape. The Incredibles. <laughs> cape and the boots, not that shut. Was Edna oh, scheming God. all along? She makes it painfully clear that she does not give She's superheroes like, cape, as syndrome. previous superheroes have struggled and died due to them. Yet Syndrome's superhero outfit comes equipped with one. Yes, it's entirely Syndrome's possible that idiot. Syndrome designed and created the suit himself. But did he go to Edna for help knowing that she was the go-to creator of the top-of-the-line superhero suit and know. could therefore make a better suit than he ever could? And did Edna outfit his suit with a cape, knowing that it would hinder his plans? Perhaps she even hoped for it to get caught in a jet turbine, just as Stratagales was. <laughs> no kicks! Number three, Willy Wonka's secret ingredient, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. My chocolate! Ah, my beautiful chocolate! Throughout the movie, it's established that Willy Wonka like, is a candy kid. genius. As his candy tastes far better than his competitors, perhaps indicating a secret ingredient. That secret ingredient? Children. Man. At least according to this theory. Wonka brings Yo, children like into his factory pain. under the guise of a tour, then rigs his factory into a massive trap. This would explain his uncaring attitude towards the kids' health and safety. Don't just stand there, do something! Help. Police. It would also explain <laughs> the human-sized pipes and how the boat and Wonka-mobile don't have any vacant seats. Wonka knew the numbers would dwindle because he had every intention of using those children for his candy. Uh -oh. Stop, don't come back. Light, camera, action! A secret of Number two, Doc wanted to get hit by the DeLorean. Back to the future. Doc! Marty! You made it! Yeah! Have you ever wondered why Doc was standing in the path of the DeLorean? Well, wonder no more. According to this theory, he did not wish to live any longer. Right before sending the DeLorean back in time, Doc laments his many past failings, which speaks to motive. He feels like a failure himself. It's taken me almost 30 years of my entire family fortune to realize the vision of that day. He's also being hunted by the Libyans, and perhaps plans on taking severe action before they can. As Doc sees it, it's a win-win situation. Either the time machine is a success and his work respected, or he dies and his troubles with failure and the Libyans die with him. 
If so, he Jeez. fully intended on taking both Marty and Einstein with him. Einstein. Hey, Einstein, where's the dot, boy? Before we continue, he be gone. sure to subscribe. Number one, Childs is actually the thing. The Gosh. thing. What do we do? Why don't we just wait here for a little while? After blowing up the station and defeating the thing, McCready and Childs share a bottle of scotch as they freeze to death. It's most definitely a depressing ending, but it could be made even worse if Childs is actually the thing. Fans of this one of many Dark the Thing theories point to numerous supposed pieces of evidence, like the fact that Childs is wearing a different coat. Others point to Childs' lack of visible breath. Finally, and perhaps most popular, is the concept that the bottle is actually filled with gasoline, and McCready was testing Childs, who inadvertently proved that he wasn't human, resulting in McCready's demoralized what? chuckle after Childs takes a drink. Man. Is there a terrifying theory we missed? Disturb us in the comments. I used to hate Ew, I don't have no time for no theories. <laughs> I can't imagine why. Okay, so that was obviously my reaction to What Culture and Watch Mojo. By the What Culture, I could kind of see it be similar to Watch Mojo and Miss Mojo when they're talking about these pop cultures like movies and TV shows straight up. I'll for sure check out more of their videos because watching the What Culture top 10 controversial for these TV shows, I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, I, I'm interested for sure for their content, especially when they're talking about these pop cultures. Um, so yeah, and um, for the Watch Mojo, the one I just got done watching, these movie theories, I'm like, yo, people got these wild imaginations straight up. I'm just like, uh, you people, are you good? Oh, why is it gonna be so freaking dark though? Like, gosh, um, jeez, people and their freaking, you know, stuff in their heads. Um, but nah, some of the theories I can kind of see, you get a pass. Others, I'm just like, WTF, what the hell is this mess? Yo, that was trash. <laughs> was trash straight up but um nah that was their theories now nah, for sure check out more of the watch mojo videos along with miss mojo which hello i have been doing it on this freaking channel and uh yeah people i am about to bounce people that watch this video all the way through you people stay lit and for those that want to see more videos you guys stay tuned until next time you people i am out deuces